We've got the lovely Jan Nielsen who's going to be doing the talk for us. She's a long-standing member in Islington. So without further ado, take it away. Okay, uh, comrades, will it? Oh, I have to switch on. I thought I had a man to do that for me, sorry. Um, okay, um, I think it's quite, uh, I'm delighted that we're having this meeting and probably it's been a bit remiss that we haven't done it before at Marxism because actually Frida Kahlo is the most iconic figure, I would argue, of the 21st uh, uh, century. Her face adorns virtually everything from tooth mugs to table mats to tennis shoes shoes and from Mexico through to virtually every gift shop across the Western world there is something that you can pick up and purchase that has the famous mono uh, browed moustached red lipstick wearing communist um, woman but it's interesting when she died in 1954 at the age of 47 the New York Times obituary was typical of many at the time it said Frido Kahlo, wife of Diego Rivera, the noted painter, was found dead in her home today. She was also a painter and has also had an active life in leftist uh, politics. Now, so hardly uh, a glowing uh, obituary. I think what's interesting is, why have we seen so this phenomenal rise of a woman who was barely known at her death? And I want to argue there's really three things that have contributed to this. Firstly, that in the 1980s there was the growth of women's studies courses right across Western universities and quite rightly, many feminists wanted to find the female painters and the female artists and give them profiles that they had been denied in the 60s and the 70s in contemporary society. And Frida was one of those. It also coincides in 1983, her first biography uh, is produced, uh, a biography by Hayden Herrera, which is still, I mean, it's quite good, but it still remains the main text on her life. And there was the quite famous film, if you were around during that time, uh, called uh, Frida, a film that starred Selma Hayek. Both came out in, 1980, in the 19, 1983. And in a way, she kind of fitted the zeitgeist of that period. And particularly because it was a period in those feminist uh, studies courses right across the universities where there was an emphasis on identity uh, politics and intersectionality. And she fitted with this because she was a mashup really, of a number of different uh, characters. I mean, for a start, she was mixed race and from dual, a dual culture. Her father was a German Lutheran and her mother was a Mexican, Spa indigenous Mexican, uh, from indigenous Mexican and Spanish descent. She was bisexual. She spent most of her life as a disabled uh, woman. She was sexually active. Uh, she was modern, but yet she was part of the indigenous culture in Mexico at the time. She was middle class, but looked to the power of ordinary poor people fighting back. And of course, she wore red lipstick and she supported communist causes. Now, there's been reams written um, about her. And uh, in lots of ways, the focus has been just on her identity and how she self-presented. I mean, some of you will probably have been, I did, and I loved the exhibition that took place at the V&A, I think just last year, uh, where they uncovered the, the, you know, the belongings of Frida Kahlo that had been stored away for decades in her bathroom. But actually, the fact that that exhibition was called Making Herself Up, I think actually doesn't take seriously enough the really the the influences on Frida Kahlo's life uh, that were really about her support her constant support for socialist and anti-imperialist causes, the fact that all 
of her lovers and friends were really members of the communist movement, uh, across the communist party actually explicitly, uh, across the world. And I want to really argue it and look at some of the historical and geographical influences on Frida Kahlo that I think made her the woman that she is. If you can go to the first, yes, the first slide, Fran. Sorry. Okay. Now, I'm going to say uh, she was born in Kayakan in 1907, but actually this was a period of revolution. The Mexican Revolution, the first shots of the Mexican Revolution uh, took place in 1910. Uh, and she later constantly uh, rewrote her birth date as 1910. She lived through the 1917 Russian Revolution. She lived in a society that was deeply divided. I mean, you know, uh, the 97 percent of people in Mexico at the start of the revolution were landless. They were organised. Pe they were peasants living on enormous estates uh, owned by a tiny elite of Mexican uh, society. The revolution was sparked by discontent at the rule of Portofio Díaz, who'd ruled Mexico for 31 years. And actually, the key thing I think about the Mexican revolution, like all social, uh, real, genuine political and social revolutions, it's always women who benefit most. And uh, Mexican women were massively oppressed. Uh, in under uh, Dyers. And one of the things, just a little example of one of the great things that brought change to women's lives in Mexico was that the new revolutionary go government brought corn mills to each individual town because prior to the revolution, women in Mexico would spend six to eight hours every day uh, milling corn for tortillas and all the other um, corn products of that time. So it, this was a period of real uh, gains for women. And women were fighters uh, of, of the Zapata and Pancho Villa uh, peasant armies. There's plenty of pictures, I haven't got one here, but there's plenty of pictures, and Frida Kahlo would have seen women with guns in every town and every village in Mexico at the time. This was a massively formative influence, the most important influence influence, I would argue, uh, on her life. However, she was a middle class girl. Her father was a photograph photographer. I could talk about the influence of photography on Frida Kahlo for hours, but I won't. But she lived quite a privileged life compared to many others. Uh, Cayacan was a, a region south of Mexico uh, City. But I also, uh, she went to a quite prestigious uh, secondary education, was in quite a prestigious academy. And in that academy, there are only 35 girls girls out of 2,000 students and she formed with a group of nine other students a little group of intellectuals, radical intellectuals inside her school who identified with the Mexican Revolution. They wore overalls, they wore dungarees, they dressed as peasants. They were uh, 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 known throughout Mexico cities for the radical politics which they ensued. But I want to just, the photo is actually about Mexico City, what it looked like in 1910. This was a cosmopolitan, uh, you know, um, developed, highly developed uh, city. It was sometimes referred to as the Paris of the Americas. Diaz had invested a lot of foreign investment in it. It was boulevards, department stores, cafes. There was a bohemian group you know, this was a place where the bohemians and cafe life flourished in Mexico uh, at the time. Also, um, I should say, I think that one of the important influences on her, uh, it was also the First World War, well, not just on her. I mean, I did a meeting in 2014 about the impact of the First World War on women, and I don't think we can exaggerate the impact of the First World War, although it was going on across the Atlantic, the pace of life 
quickened enormously as a result of uh, the First World War. Women went out to work, socialised, smoked in public, drank in public for the very first time in the First World War. What women looked like changed. They cut their hair because our hairpins were used to make the bombs. We didn't wear nylons anymore because the nylon was used for parachute. Women wore trousers. There was an enormous change. Next slide, please. And I'll just give you here two of the famous actresses. My mother would have known them. Uh, she, de she definitely did. Dolores Del, Le, Del, Del Levo and Lupe Valdez. These were the images. These were the images. So, you know, lots of people make a big thing that Frida Kahlo was totally original. Other women were doing this as well. And I make the point that really virtually nobody, no woman wore makeup before 19 this flourished in the aftermath of the First World War. Economic circumstances, material circumstances actually change the way that you present yourself. And Frida Kahlo, next slide please, Frida Kahlo was no um, different. I mean here, a famous photo of her, everyone makes it, lots of people make a big thing that she's really very, very different because she's got her bobbed hair, but so has her sister Christina. Most women were bobbing their hair um, at this time. Next slide please I would also I mean lots of people make a lot of and if you've read, uh, seen the uh, film the Selma Hayek film Frida the scene of this is that you know they're all setting up for a family photo Frida runs in late dressed in her male clothing her dad raises his eyes to heaven her mother's shocked but again, I would make the point, you know, Marlena Dietrich was being shown in every single cinema across the world, and really she barely wore anything other than women's clothing. I can remember Catherine Hepburn in those fantastic pants and suits in some of those films. Again, this was something that was an experience for large numbers of women. They, uh, you know, they experimented with their dress, they experimented with, the, with what they look, looked like. Okay, so, I'm, you know, she was great, but she wasn't that unusual is really the point I'm making. Now, uh, I, the next point I suppose I want to make is really we have to talk about the terrible life-changing accident that she had when she was 19 at the age in 1925. I mean people will know, I'm sure, she was travelling on a, uh, a wooden bus with her boyfriend, it crashes into another uh, vehicle, uh, she is thrown to the ground naked, a pole pierces her pelvis, her leg is broken in 25 places, her spine's bro broken in three, she lives the rest of her life really as somebody with quite serious disabilities. Over the course of the rest of her life she has over 30 um, operations. Um, she wasn't expected to live, she spent months in hospital uh, recuperating, she goes home to recuperate and she previously had ambitions to be a doctor which again I think is an important point if you look at some of her paintings um, but also she, and her, her dad puts a mirror above her bed and really from then she starts to paint and as Frida says this isn't some kind of egotistic um, obsession that she painted herself, it's not the same as selfies at all, she said in her own words, I painted what I know, I painted my own reality. Now the next slide is the first self-portrait that Frida Kahlo paints. She paints this just a year after the accident, it's to send to her boyfriend, the guy that was with her when she had the accident, now, this, I think, Picasso said of Frida Kahlo, not about this painting, but about all of her paintings, when he wrote to Diego Rivera, he said, nobody paints a face like Frida Kahlo. You don't, Diego, I don't, Die I don't paint like that. It's the painting of the faces that I think is the most important. Now, this is much different from her later self-portraits, but I think there's a couple of things to say about it. Firstly, to paint 
saying this after you've had that kind of accident is just astounding. Uh, you can't probably see that the, the, the jacket is red velvet. Red velvet had lots of sexual and um, personal connotations at the time. She has that typical straight gaze at the viewer, which is to personify virtually all of her self-portraits. And what's wonderful about this painting, I think, which reflects right through, is that this is a woman with agency. This isn't about the male gaze. This isn't about being coquettish. It isn't about being available. This woman is in the moment and she's in control of herself. Her stare is at you, but it is not sexualized. I don't believe in any real way. And that was to um, be, um, you know, part of her life. Now, I'll go on to the life, her life with Diego Rivera, because she often referred to this as the biggest, the second biggest accident of her life. Um, she met him in 1927, was really uh, via uh, her female lover, Tina Madotti, which I could write, do a whole other meeting on. There is a stonking woman, Tina Madotti. Blimey. But anyway, uh, they, they meet, and it's really interesting at the first meeting, firstly. She basically approaches Diego. She's got 17 paintings. She knows he's a philanderer. She's, des she's desperate to get into bed with him. Uh, and she basically says to him, I've got 17 paintings. I know what you're like. I know we're going to end up sleeping together. But I want you to be honest about my paintings. Yeah? And because she had to earn a living. She felt she had to earn a living. And this is what Diego, in his biography, says about seeing those paintings for the, uh, at the time. He said, you know, about this woman, showed me these paintings, and I saw an unusual energy of expression, precise delineation of character, and true severity. They had a fundamental plastic honesty and an artistic personality of their own. It was obvious to me that this girl was an authentic artist. Now I make that point and I could give you loads, I will give you one more in a minute, loads of quotes from Diego Rivera. He admired her immensely as an artist and throughout their tumultuous life, yes he was a philanderer, she had relationships too, I mean she had a 10 year relationship uh, with a Hungarian photographer whose name escapes me at the moment but for 10 years, she was also so uh, promiscuous. And there's a kind of myth, I think, a lot of feminist tracks really talk about how he really dominated her and he turned her in to, you know, he structured or insisted on the way she dressed and he made her into a, a typical Mexican woman. I don't really believe that's right. But next, next thing, can I just show? She, he did influence her enormously. This is Diego Rivera. He was the, co painting I mean, he was the colossus of Mexican mural art. It was deliberately developed as a, a mechanism of educating the masses, uh, used very simplistic on a huge, great scale. Or, but it wasn't just the way he painted, it's who people painted that was important. And uh, always about ordinary, uh, ordinary people. Next slide. I want to, this is one of the first uh, paintings that Frida Kahlo uh, sells, thank you, and you can see this is a painting, this is actually a painting of two of the maids that worked in, in her home that she would have known incredibly well. Again, I think, you know, when Picasso says she paints faces like no other, I think that again, this is the power of uh, Frida Kahlo that she then paints what she sees, but particularly it's, it's very capable of painting, um, uh, you know, with other women. It's the beginning of, it is true, it's the beginning of her and her meet her relationship with uh, Diego Rivera. So I should say he joined the Communist Party in 1922. She joined after she met him in 27. She joined in 1928. 
and the painting of, of indigenous people was an, an anti-imperialist action because in the previous, prior to the revolution, as you could have seen from those photographs of Mexico City, it, the idea was that everything Western had to be emul emulated. Everything modern and Western was good. And it's no accident that Diego and Frida Kahlo adopt, or she particularly adopts, indigenous forms of dress, etc., in order really to identify with the peasant and the, uh, the, the, uh, the revolution and to basically say, no, the West is not best. We have a culture of our own that we have to encourage and develop and admire and respect. And I think this painting, and what was, again, I, I mean, it, it's in the Boston uh, Museum of Art, or whatever it's called, and actually people say this is one of the first paintings, certainly of, in the Americas, of ordinary um, people. If we can go to the next slide. Now, this is, and I love this painting, because it's called Diego on my mind. It's a bit later, but this is, uh, I read a, uh, an essay by some feminist uh, painters who really said this was a painting, the far one, obviously, was really a painting that showed that Diego Rivera was really um, a patriarch and was completely dominant and he, you know, structured her life and the way she looked, etc. I think it's a deeply ironic painting, uh, and she had a great sense of humour uh, because it's based on um, the uh, indigenous women of Tijuana. Uh, this is a region south of Mexico City. I mean, here's a more uh, original uh, than her painting. And these women were known, I mean, one of the things about indigenous Mexican society was that it was often matri and historically it had been matriarchal. I mean, these women were known to be very good at economics and um, they, you know, they held wealth uh, and controlled wealth in their own communities. In, a, in these societies also, women, because they were the birth givers, the life givers, they had a much higher status. So although we may look at this and think, oh my God, isn't that like a nun? I mean, isn't this in some way, this dress, this form of dress is restrictive and uh, oppressive? Actually, she is saying, I am one of the women of Tawana. I am one of the strong women of Tawana. And I just think it's so funny that she has Diego at the center of her forehead. She was, as I can't stress enough, completely bonkers about the bloke, um, madly in love with him. If you read her diary, uh, which is worth reading, I mean, she writes so passionately and poetically about both the physical love that they shared, the spiritual love that they shared, but also she talks in all of it about the comradeship that she found with Diego Rivera and, uh, you know, the Communist uh, Party. But again, I think just interesting that, you know, these were sort of symbols of creativity, matriarchy, fertility. And again, it was a snub at the Western culture. As always, the Western culture tried to impose a much more patriarchal view of um, uh, society. Okay, next slide, please. That's just a slide of how she adopted uh, the dress in different ways. She most often looked like this, although the far image, again, a photograph taken by one of her many lovers, uh, obviously she dressed up for the occasion. All right, Diego and her marry in 1928. Uh, uh, they are expelled uh, from the Communist Party in 1929. Well, Diego is, and then she follows him. She leaves the Communist Party. They're part of the left opposition um, in, in Mexico. But actually, the next big influence on her life is really uh, the time that her and Diego spent in America between 1930 and 1933. Um, Are we on slide 12? Next one, please. 
Okay, now uh, Diego goes to America uh, because he's to be honest, quite frank, he is developing his career. I mean, he's getting big dosh and big publicity from doing murals at Rockefeller uh, Foundation and, and for the Ford uh, Company. Uh, but also, he goes to America because actually he really believes, not unwisely, that the industrial uh, West is the place where the new revolution will take place. And he admires the development of technology and, and methods of production that are creating huge working classes in America. He really wants to be where he thinks the action is going to be. And of course, he's not wrong because you have the big Teamsters Rebellion in 1934, followed by the Great Unrest in 1936. So his political loyalties, he's getting paid they, uh, by the bourgeoisie, but his, his political reason for being there is really because of that. Uh, Fr Frida Kahlo hates America. She talks about the Americans that they're all ugly, she thinks they look like potatoes. Uh, she thinks they're utterly, utterly boring. Uh, she resents the amount of time that she has to spend being wined and dined at these fancy dinners. Now, I mean, I just laugh at this photo, and there are a number of them. I mean, have you ever gone somewhere where you are totally inappropriately addressed? Yeah? I mean, I certainly have. I mean, but she does it deliberately. She hasn't worn the wrong... She goes everywhere she goes in America, she dresses as a Mexican woman. It's a political statement. It's not just that she likes that kind of gear as opposed to what those other women are wearing, but actually it's a, it is a political statement. But also, while she's in America, she really rifles feathers because she hates the anti-Semitism that she sees. Next slide, please that she witnesses in America. And indeed, she pretends, she does a lot of pretending to rifle people, uh, uh, irritate people, but she pretends that she is part Jewish, that her father was uh, Jewish. She makes Rockefeller spit out his soup at one dinner when she says to him, well, clearly you look Jewish, because he was a known uh, anti um, but she paints about the conflict between her and Diego. I mean, this is a typical one. I should have mentioned, of course, also, what's lovely about Frida for lots of people is that she's smoking in virtually every painting of herself. Uh, she's dressed rather modestly here, but smoking and with a Mexican flag. And you can see how she's juxtaposing, you know, the great machinery, uh, the great smog of America with kind of the more life-giving forces of Mexico, the roots down at the bottom versus the electric cables. But perhaps the next painting, if you don't mind, is again one very characteristic of this period. And, I mean, this is an astounding painting in and of itself. I mean, I'm no artist, pretty. I've never studied art in my life. But, you know, she, Diego was painting on enormous canvases. She's painting small retablos. I mean, I think this painting is only in real life. It's only about the double the size, perhaps three times the size of this thing of paper, you know, the A4 sheet of paper. But you can see, I mean, quite what were Mae West, I don't really un quite understand that, but she has a monument. She says one of the things, the Americans are obsessed about toilets, <laughs> bathrooms, and obsessed about personal hygiene. She writes about this in her diary. You know, they kind of wash everything away. They're obsessed. But I think what's it most interesting, sorry, is down the bottom, she's got the queues, I mean, this is 1933, she's got the queues outside, the soup kitchens, uh, you know, this is the, the homeless, and really, uh, she says, and just what she says about this period and writing these, I fell to rage against all the rich guys here, since I have seen thousands of the people of, in the most terrible misery without anything to eat and no place to sleep. This is what most impressed me here. It's terrifying to see the rich having p parties day and night while thousands of people are dying of hunger. 
so good for her. Now also, next slide, I'll have to hurry I think, I think the next point about Frida Kahlo is really that she pioneered, I mean pioneered isn't quite the word, she is the first woman to really paint about the female experience. I mean, this is a painting, very famous, 1932. She has a terrible, difficult miscarriage while she's in America. I won't go on into all the symbolism because I haven't got time, maybe later. But I just want to read to you what Diego Rivera says about this painting and about that time. He says, Frida's tragedy, for such she felt it to be, inspired her to paint a canvas depicting a miscarriage and expressing the sensations and emotions it gives rise to. She also painted a picture representing her own birth. Immediately thereafter, she began to work on a series of masterpieces which had no precedent in the history of art. Paintings which exalted the feminine qualities of endurance to truth, reality and cruelty. Never before had a woman such put, put such agonised poetry onto canvas. Hooray! What a marvellous, um, you know, uh, thing to be said uh, by him about her. Much more succinctly, André Breton, uh, a surrealist who was a great admirer of Frida Kahlo, said very simply, she paints a ribbon around a bomb. Okay, now they return to Mexico, I'm right at, uh, coming up to the end, to say they are part of the early Fourth International, uh, her and Diego are, uh, they set up a solid solidarity committee uh, for the Spanish uh, Republic, uh, they famously petitioned for Trotsky uh, to be given exile uh, in uh, Mexico. Uh, Trotsky and his wife Natalia Sadova. Uh, she has an affair, uh, not you know, not a terribly important affair, I don't think, with uh, Trotsky. But most importantly, really, after Trotsky is assassinated in 1940, not uh, they're not related, but Frida Kahlo's health seriously, seriously uh, deteriorates. Uh, next slide. In 1945, uh, she has a major operation where they try to fuse a bone, bone graft to a steel support. She spends, which isn't successful, she has a series of operations following that. 1953, she has her leg amputated. Um, she rejoins the Communist Party in 1948. And there's a lot made of the fact that really Frida seems to become a fervent Stalinist uh, in her later life. I mean, certainly, I mean, obviously that's a lovely page, but also look at the face. I mean, she is a different woman. This is a different Frida. This is a Frida who's in agony. She's dependent on morphine. She's drinking a lot at the time to numb the physical pain. But the next, uh, you know, painting, uh, uh, she, uh, she, she paints, she's in a cast. She famously paints on her own. Uh, the hammer and sickle, uh, the, the symbol of uh, Stalinism in, in Russia at the time, and the last, the next one, and her, one of her last paintings, not her best, is actually of Stalin. Um, now, I want to say, I mean, certainly, you know, I'm not going to try and excuse her Stalinism, but she wasn't dissimilar from a swathe of other intellectuals at the time in the 40s. Obviously, you had the German assault on Russia, the beginning of Barbarossa, the thousands and thousands of Russians who were murdered. You had the rise of the Cold War in 1945, and she, she stood on the side what she thought was the side of the oppressed against America, as I say she hated. I'll just end with this because I have to finish now. This is the last photograph of Frida Kahlo ever taken. It's just, I think, weeks before uh, she dies and it's in a march against intervention in Guatemala. Now, 
I mean, so she starts her adult life on a demonstration supporting workers. She ends her life as an anti-imperialist. Now, we're not in favour of icons, so was she a revolutionary icon? We're not in favour of icons, icons. But I think what I hope I've tried to do this afternoon is just show that she was more than a woman who liked dressing up and was pretty to look at. She was somebody, as I say, that the struggle to, for liberation was something that characterised and developed uh, and, and helped develop her as an adult. And it's something that all of those that have written all the iconic material about her just constantly ignore. Oh, wow. Jan so much for that talk I thought it was really interesting and it's brilliant to have all the visuals as well and to, to see what you're talking about I think Frida Kahlo is a really interesting figure um, and I just wanted to say to add about um, her legacy I think that as your talk showed there's kind of lots of different Frida Kahlo's and like you say for example the Stalinism at the end or um, the commercialization of her art like there's lots of if you look at art history, there's different interpretations and there are art historians who say, oh, she wasn't really political. Yeah. She didn't really mean all that stuff. And I think it's really important for the left to, to know more about this woman and to, and to recognize her um, for what she was, which was very political. And also I wanted to say something quickly about the commercialization of her legacy. Um, the um, skatewear brand Vans, have just released a new collection of shoes with Frida Kahlo's image on them. Um, I think it's like it's an example of lots of fashion brands that are that are making money from Frida Kahlo's legacy. So I think it is really important for us to to reclaim her legacy as a political one. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant meeting, thank you. Um, and I've learnt more, which is really brilliant. And I just, yeah, just to kind of, I think, for me, I just find Frida Kahlo so inspiring. And I think it's just so, so important to, like, stress her revolutionary roots and to make sure, us as revolutionary socialists, that we really fight to defend um, those. When people, like, because it makes my skin crawl when people like Theresa May wears a Frida Kahlo bracelet. I'm like, excuse me. Like, I wanted to rip it off her bloody wrist. Anyway, um, and I just, because actually, she was always on the, you know, the side of the oppressed, and I think that's so important. And, um, to remember and like her art uh, expressed that and her you know actually revolution itself is you know a festival of the oppressed and I feel like her art kind of reflects that breaking off the chains and everything um, the bright colors and everything else um, for me anyway and I just think as well like you see how in revolutions art um, does flourish and ordinary people uh, really can express themselves in ways they haven't been able to before and I think you really see that in Sudan uh, just been reading about how the art has really flourished there during the revolution um, there's some amazing street art happening in Sudan at the moment so yeah I just want to stress that point I think it's just so important that we absolutely like claim her as a revolutionary we don't let people like Theresa May try and you know express the sh her support what she what has she done for women uh, she's only made life worth for women so yeah Hi. I, I think Frida, I, Frida Kahlo has become an icon and that's a problem that I, she has through many ways in which she's been presented she's become a fridge magnet or a bracelet and something which on one hand absolutely depoliticised, decontextualised her. But also, the thing about icons is icons don't have agency. Icons are things for uh, sitting down or kneeling down and worshipping. And the way in which uh, Carlo has been, has been produced is something which is something out there which has nothing to do with society, who didn't have ideas for the video, but she painted some pretty pictures. And it's something which we need to get back. In this context, I've got a question. I, I have a slight problem with a number of exhibitions show Carlo in the context of her disability, of her illnesses. And I think, in partly, that can be done very well. I mean, you've shown a thing with the picture in the velvet dress as the look of defiance of, uh, of, of fighting against him, or um, with the, the picture of her miscarriage where. I, I must be the first painting of a miscarriage of, 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 of a tall thing. And so there is a way in which 
showing her in an illness can show that she's fighting back against them, but also it kind of it, it, it individualizes her. It, it, it means that it, it, it takes away the idea she has about politics, the way she has about society, and shows you see in a lot of the exhibition, Frida did all these things, fighting against this terrible illness, fighting against terrible Diego and terrible patriarchy and, 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 and all these things. And it ends up showing us a victim as somebody who really was fighting an individual, at best fighting an indiv individual fight, at the worst was just a pure, a pure victim uh, uh, who was, and it's a shame she had that accident, it's a shame uh, the actual, and is there a way Really, of t of t I mean, yeah, and to what extent can we take away this? Can we can, can, can we can we show her as a fighter? And to what extent can we talk about her her illness as, uh, as being something which is which is relevant to, to her? I and mean, I don't really want to go into the very vulgar Marxist. We will only talk about her when she's on a strike. I, I, that, that her illness, her miscarriage, was a real part of her, a part of her life, and, so, and, and and something which which she suffered from. And a fight against her is, is is inspirational. But I think that leaving it just as her being a, a, a not well woman is kind of loses loses some of the power that she has. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, thanks, Shan. I really enjoyed that talk. And I guess, um, of course, I knew the commodif commodification aspect of freedom was going to come up uh, in the discussion. I did want to talk about it a little bit. Last night, I went to John Molly News meeting on the dialectics of art, and um, I understood it then. But I think now, coming to this meeting about Frida Kahlo, I understand what he was talking about even more. And he was talking about you've kind of got two processes of um, uh, like dialectics within art, and that's the dialectics of different differentiation and the dialectics of democratization as he calls it. You can really see that with Frida Kahlo, the way in which she responds to things that are going on around her and impact her in the world um, and how she, you know her art really is a political commentary of the society in which she's living in. And also, you know, the dialectics of democratization and how nowadays they're kind of pushed back against the radical you know the radical aspects of her art and like what we've talked about, you know, the kind of commodification of her work. And you know, I think it's absolutely disgusting that capitalism's co-opted Frida. Like Jasmine mentioned, the fact that Theresa May's got the audacity to wear a bracelet adorned with Frida Kahlo when clearly she knows nothing about what the woman stood for, um, and neither do the majority of the ruling class who kind of put her up as this sort of like individual icon. And I think Jan's right to know that, you know, we, um, we don't iconise uh, individuals. You know, Frida was part of a movement that a lot of women were a part of, and I think we've got to be careful, you know, to draw into these like identity politics arguments of describing and freed her as a Mexican woman, a bisexual woman, a disabled woman, you know, the only word we should really use for she was a revolutionary and in every aspect of her life and she encompasses so many different struggles and I think, you know, the way in which capitalism commodifies every single thing that we produce is not news to us as Marxists um, you know, something that came out uh, in the meeting yesterday was like a kind of about Banksy and how he had recently had that image that was sold for 1.2 million that's over bees and then it shredded itself and then capitalism kind of had its last laugh because that actually just increased the price of the work by 50% and I think as revolutionaries we've got to really make sure that capitalism doesn't have the last laugh with Frida Kahlo I think especially for young women we've always got to fight for our space and Marxism is a place where we don't have to fight for it we're welcome to at the forefront of all of it and you know I think we need to make sure that you know that capitalism doesn't dilute and extinguish Frida's politics you know she's our our icon, she's our revolutionary, and I think we need to fight for that and say that. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, I, um, I, I think Frida Kahlo has been uh, very inspiring for me for, for many years, uh, both because of her, I think, her personality and her art. Her life is, I think, is inspiration because I think she, she always was an agent and on different levels. Uh, she was an agent because she always decided in her life what could she change. She, mm. she always did something. She mm. was never just passive. Mm. And I think probably the, that is probably part of the problem now with making her icon is that some of that time she was not able to do very much because mm. of her disability. And that is not something that can be changed in a way because that was part of her life and a big part. But I think when I don't think many people would have been able to do all the things she did in that incredible suffering she did, yeah. she did yeah. have in her life. 
and I don't think you can underestimate, I don't, can't even begin to try and even think what it would have been like to live physically, just live mm. with the pain she had. But she did incredible things and I don't think we should, we should just, I think the best we could do is probably just to have that discussion, bring to the fore all the things she did do in terms of being a member of the Communist Party, all the demonstrations she did in her locality. Yeah. Yeah. In her local area, she was always active, even yeah. to those last photos, yeah. she was active in the groups, even though she was in Morphe. You know, she was yeah. always trying to see what can I do where I am with what I have. And I think her pictures are incredible. I think the symbolism in them, they, mm. they are, di you know, the, the dualism in them, yeah. they, there's always something new you can see in them, something new you can read from them. Um, socialists are not going to be the only ones who are going to take, make an interpretation of her pictures, but we have certainly somebody we can use to, um, um, to in a class, in a struggle for women's liberation, I think she's incredibly important, she has been for me, and I'm sure for many young women as well. Yeah. I just want to uh, concur with that and also say how really important Frida Kahlo was to me as a feminist, uh, in the, a young feminist in the 70s, that when they rediscovered her, and it's interesting this is 83, it sort of um, was, it was wonderful for us because it actually changed the description of what a feminist was, which had become almost straitjacketing because you had to be a kind of certain type and you had to do certain things and be exa it was becoming very prescriptive and looking at Frida Kahlo just kind of wiped it, it, it and it also opened our minds to that really we should embrace all sorts of women no matter how they look and what they you know whether they wear lipstick or not <laughs> it was okay and I, th I thank her for and the rediscovery of her for that it was really important to us yeah, uh, I actually wanted to say something about that because I um, I studied art history and um, in art history I had a big book called Jensen's Art History and in the 70s I heard there were no women artists in the whole book. So because of the 80s yeah. Uh, women started looking like, have there actually yeah. never been any women of importance doing art, doing, you know, uh, contributing to society? And the answer is yes, there have been, of course, but they're written out of history because history is written by the oppressors. It's written by the ruling class. It's written about predominantly white uh, uh, men uh, who, have, who have been part of that power dynamic. So it was hugely important to discover Frida Kahlo for, for that instance, but also discover a whole lot of other ranges of women in art. There was a whole movement in uh, art history, and I think we still need that one today. I was also at the Talk of Art and Dialectics, and I greatly enjoyed it, and I look forward to reading the book, but there were only two female artists in the whole presentation. How is that possible? I mean, the uh, education system is running over with women, but they, uh, when you ask someone name uh, uh, a, fa uh, a famous artist, then they say Picasso, they say Van Gogh, where, is, where are all these artists now and where are the new artists of today? And I think that is what Frida Kahlo offers us. She offers us hope. No, we do not want to idolize her. No, we don't want to put her on a pedestal. We want to learn from her. We want to take her example and put it on to us and, clear, uh, and learn and strive and aspire and continue the struggle just as uh, she did. And we want to be the best we can. And yes, of course, we will make mistakes, but we want to make society better. And we want a place for all women to look fabulous, all people, LGBTQI, whatever, to look fabulous. And I think we need to rediscover more of this uh, people, I, mean, I greatly in, uh, enjoyed your talk for that. Thank you. Interesting that you mentioned Blue House, Casa Azul, because what I wanted to say was I, I'm, a, I'm an artist who's also dabbled in alternative living spaces, and um, one of the things that Frida did was experimented with different ways of living, yeah. and she, she and uh, her and Diego designed the Blue House so that they yeah. could have two different yes. living spaces and they had a walkway go between. Mm. It's absolutely amazing and I really love that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 
I think that uh, one of the things that often doesn't get focused on a lot in exhibits as well is uh, practice. Um, I think you know. I think there was a thing in Teen Vogue uh, about Frida Kahlo, and it had the line that a friend pointed out to me that despite her disabilities, you know, and her accidents, oh, she was still a revolutionary thing. Which is very weird because very often it is, you know, these forms of marginalisation that is what creates revolutionary consciousness. And I think um, you see actually that you know these her artwork are crystallised points reflecting her life and her practice like you know like alternative living spaces she turned her cast as well into sort of uh, form of practice you know the way that she dressed was practice and her yeah. art and the way she lived was essentially um, showing how you need to be an active human being engaging in everything and the images she makes are not just you know simple you know symbols or icons they call for us to engage with them and to analyze them and to try and understand them um, it was Marx in sort of uh, the thesis on Feuerbach who said that the problem with all sort of you know thought of human society um, at the moment is or hitherto is that we think of um, ideas as things rather than sort of you know what he said sensuous human activity as practice and I think it's quite dangerous this idea of turning sort of Frida Kahlo into an icon and the fact that it's commercialised because it then tries to see, you know, as this sort of separate end uh, result thing. And it tries to turn, you know, the fact that they focus on sort of her makeup and dresses, it then tries to turn, you know, ways of female expression into just things and not, you know, ways of that women try to live within a capitalist patriarchal society. Um, yeah, and I think that's an incredibly dangerous thing because then it then turns you know, um, you know what are very deliberate decisions or you know conscious decisions by women in the ways to express them into just you know frivolous, shallow things. And I think yeah, it, and, it, and it, that sort of goes out to images as well. Images are not just simply separate, set in stone things. They call for us to interpret and engage with them, and you know, and then we can apply that to our human activity, to society, and to other human beings. Yeah. Um, I really liked the um, painting right at the beginning that you showed because you, you know, um, the red velvet yeah. robe and you sort of talked about um, there kind of being you know lot sexual kind of connotations to the red velvet robe but that absolutely the way she painted that face with that kind of really solid stare kind of completely goes against all what, you, what we're used to seeing in kind of well, Western classical yeah. art anyway, of what you talked about, the kind of coquettish available uh, gaze, you know, designed to be, um, you know, paint, usually painted by men. Mm. But there's, that really kind of, uh, I could really relate to that about um, her, because it, there's, there's always this thing with women of kind of, um, having our sexuality kind of, you know, wanting to be able to express our sexuality but not have it kind of, you know, um, so it sort of, that was, that I really kind of identified with that. Uh, thank you for the talk, I really enjoyed and I actually love that picture with Isabella Vargas and I wonder if you can tell us something uh, more about her relation, their relationship and also if you know if, if um, Frida was in contact with more women yeah. like her and talk, tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. I'm just going to make a contribution about revolutionary icons because although we have problems with them, I think it, it seems like you're more likely to see an image of Frida Kahlo nowadays than Che, che Guevara. Yeah. I just wonder, is, is it a fair comparison or not? Um, because obviously she's an artist, he wasn't, but obviously she's both very, very political and revolutionary socialists. You know, is it, is it something about kind of the, the, the climate we live in, kind of, you know, the... Um, the prominence of kind of women's oppression, you know, me, me too, you know, all this sort of stuff. You know, why is it that we're more like to see Frida Kahlo than Che Guevara nowadays? Thanks. Um, I, I, I want to go back to the appropriation of Frida Kahlo by, by the bourgeoisie, yeah. by the ruling class. I work in a university in, a, in Glasgow, and recently the Equalities Unit called, uh, called uh, advertised 
an exhibition looking at feminist icons um, as you know inspirations to young young women. And I thought it was a brilliant idea and was quite excited in going along to look at it. They looked at four women in particular. And they, you start, they started off with Cleopatra as, as one. The second one was Frida Kahlo. The third person was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and the fourth, sorry, it's, going, it's, well, it's hard to get lower than Thatcher, I will admit. The fourth was uh, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> right? And this was the Equalities Unit of the University's yeah. idea of the of the way it was done. I was, I was I'm not normally quiet or taciturn, but quite taken aback by the whole way the, by the whole by, by by the way it was done. And this is what we're going to have to try and, and fight against. I think in the in the future. And your your talk was a, a I think a brilliant help in in that. Um, and I think for those of us who don't know a huge amount about Frida Kahlo, but knew she was on our side, to see her placed with all those other women is actually almost quite uh, quite quite depressing in many ways. I just want to say a couple of words really about the importance of the period that Jan was talking about when uh, at the late of the 30s when Andre Breton was in Mexico City. I think that, uh, I mean I should be, it's like we, I don't want to say that Che Guevara is the icon of the upturn and, uh, and Frida's the icon of the downturn but there's, there's certain truths in there who determines what is still in the hands of the ruling class and the ruling class uh, uh, through their ideologies and their uh, uh, idea factories called universities. But nevertheless, um, in that period, uh, 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 they stood against, not only, uh, when they stood with the left opposition against Stalin, they stood against the defeat of the Russian Revolution. <laughs> and the only voice that was, you couldn't say that in Europe, Andre Breton I had to go to say it with Trotsky and with Diego um, in Mexico, along with Frida. They had to say it there because that was the only place where they could say it. And uh, it was very important for us. They drew up the uh, Revolutionary Manifesto for a Revolutionary Art at that time. I'm sure that Frida had something to do with that, although she's not a signature on it. And I think that we have to do that. And the other thing we want to finish up with is that it was good that you didn't show it, but what's interesting is almost every of the most important Diego Rivera murals, somewhere in it is Frida. And if, if you like, he made the icon of the revolutionary Frida um, in terms of the visual arts. And also I have to remember when they did the mural at the Rockefeller Center in New York, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rockefeller stopped it because it had a picture of Lenin in it. And uh, it was machine torn off the wall. Yeah. And uh, yeah. while uh, the National Guard stood with guns to stop the workers uh, stopping the destruction of that mural. So actually both of them ended up not having too good a time in America. Yeah. Normal, thank you very, very much for all those fantastic uh, contributions, and particularly for those of you who pointed out all the stuff that I really would have liked to have talked about, but just didn't really have time. I mean, when we come to the thing about why has she become the icon, I think the question about commodity is the answer. I mean, you know, that the ruling class will make money out of every aspect of our lives, and I suspect. You know, I, I mean, I hope, you know, the, the fact that there was this kind of resurgence in the 1980s when there were the women's studies and the film and, and the biography, of course. But I think, you know, to be honest, why manufacturers can see that you can get money from women who buy Frida Kahlo stuff rather than all the old icons, the old male icons, aren't they? They can see a market and they want to make some money out of it. And Frida Kahlo is their female market personified I think. The other thing I think about you know when it's obviously you know part of the fact that she becomes a commodity is about the depoliticization um, of her as a, a, as a socialist and an activist but also the tragedy
tragedy of it, which I think all, all of you who spoke have pointed out, is that the quality and the importance of her art is also minimised. So although, you know, she's Frida Kahlo the artist, it's still, it's the photos of her, it's the image of her, it's the kind of mono, all that stuff is what we know about her, rather than any real I think, genuine depth of understanding about the importance of what she was and the fact that she, as I say, the first woman or the first person ever to paint about these things that had been thought of as so personal. I mean, abortions and, and miscarriages, remember, I mean, still today, they are a, 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 pele, a place, uh, uh, they're stigmatized, they're not talked about. Even today, to paint this in 1930 was a revolutionary act. There's no doubt about it. And it shocked people to the core. And people, I think, lots of people want to put that stuff still in 2019 will put that stuff aside and have a pretty image of her up um, rather than the experience the real experience of women and also I will say I mean I don't want anyone to come away thinking I'm a great fan of Diego Rivera. I think there were lots of problems uh, with him. But again, nobody, no man, let alone a woman, was actually painting about the strife inside a relationship. And she painted loads of paintings about the strife, the agony of love, not just the pleasure, the agony of love, uh, which, let's face it, most of us will probably have experienced Experience, but nobody was talking about that at the um, at the time. Um, so that's important. I also want to say a, a bit about disability. I don't know whether I really uh, agree with you. Uh, what you know, what you were talking about, how we shouldn't focus on the disability. I mean, on a really trivial point, you know, I've had two hip replacements in the last two years. I cannot. I'm, I get what you said I thought was really important. I mean, she was in pain the whole of her adult life. And I mean, you think about it. I mean, she, I forgot to mention, she had polio at the age of seven, so she had one leg shorter than the other anyway. All credit to her father, interestingly, who taught her to box, made sure she ran, rode a bike. He insisted that his daughter wasn't uh, disabled by it, that she was um, able, fit and able. You think about the royal family. I mean, at this time, the royal family, there were cousins, weren't there, of the Queen Mother, who had some kind of mental disability or physical, I can't remember, but they were hidden away in some great institution out in the countryside or on a hilltop somewhere and forgotten for decades. Anyone in Mexico, 25, in 1925, the medical resources that she would have had access, access to were virtually non-existent and most women, or men as well, any family with a child with this kind of injury would have been locked up and left inside and probably would never have seen the fresh air again. So I, I think this is a very positive image of uh, disability uh, that she uh, represents. So I'm in favour of talking about it. I think, you know, it, it, uh, uh, and emphasising it a bit more. I think it's a, an example of how people can overcome circumstances with the right conditions. Um, this photograph, I, I, I don't know, I thought this was a p picture, I'm sure it is, of her and Tina Madotti. And I think, oh, is it not? Okay, I've got the wrong one. I think it is. And it was taken by another great friend who was a photographer called Lucia, Lucienne, a woman, Block. And you asked about her relationship with, relationships with women. I mean, it was Lucienne Block, uh, again, who was a photographer, a famous photographer, um, who accompanied her back to Mexico after, uh, the, ter after the terrible uh, termination in the Henry Ford Hospital. And just a lovely thing, I haven't got the, I can't find it, I did have it. But you know, uh, after her death, Lucianne Block 
really says that, you know, Frida Kahlo was fun. And she was a great, great friend. And Lucy Ann Block talks about the wonderful times that these two women had together when they didn't have two nickel, two pesos, to rub together, yeah? Which I think, you know, on my gravestone, or I probably won't have one, I would like my women friends to say something as positive about that. You know, they were, they were sisters, but because they were comrades. I mean, Lucy Ann Block was a member of the Communist Party as well. Uh, but Tina Madotti was um, her lover. Uh, I can't remember how long for, but uh, certainly for the period running up to her uh, ma marriage to Diego Rivera. The next slide. And I do want to say this. I, it's, it's another talk altogether, really, about the influence of photography. I said that her father was a photographer. Frida Kahlo had helped him, worked with him very often, because uh, he was an epileptic and she used to go around to support him when he was doing uh, 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 photographs. He was commissioned by the Mexican government uh, as a photographer, so she knew photography really well. But these are two, I mean, Tina Madotti's photographs are two absolutely die for. I mean, here was a woman, and she was Italian originally, again, uh, Roger's quite right to specify uh, about how many of the progressives had to come uh, into Mexico. It was a place of um, refuge uh, for them. Uh, Breton virtually bought, I think originally bought most of Tina Madotti's uh, photographs. Her photographs are amazing. I mean, they're simple. They're poignant, they're dignified about the oppressed, but she was a communist woman in every aspect of her life. And they remained friends after, uh, 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 after she married Diego Rivera, and I think women played an enormous uh, part in her life. Can you go to slide 29? Because I just want to give Roger a thrill. Okay, exactly. <laughs> this is what I was going to end up with. De Roger is quite right. Most of the depictions by Diego Rivera were always really of Frida at the centre in red. And again, what a fantastic uh, tribute to your partner. Here is she distributing the guns. That's the way we ought to remember Frida Kahlo, up in arms and fighting the, for the oppressed.